You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. What a beautiful day for horses in the morning. You are listening to the number one horse podcast in the world. Here's your entertaining look at the horse world and the people in it. I'm Glenn Geek from Ocala, Florida. And I am Allison Renborg from Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and you are listening to the monthly Equine Affair episode of Horses in the Morning on the Horse Radio Network for January 19th, episode 3103. This episode is brought to you by Equine Affair. Good morning, horse world. It's the third Thursday of the month. That means it's time for the Equine Affair episode, North America's premier equine expo and equestrian gathering. So, Glenn, I have something adorable to tell you. Okay, I'm ready. Are you sure? I'm you, you I'm might sure. you might keel over from okay. the cuteness. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> granted, I'm biased. Uh, my little girl is 16 months old. And at Christmas, um, I finally had the opportunity to introduce her to my very senior pony. This is the last of my childhood horses who has survived to my adulthood. Um, I finally had the chance to introduce my child, my firstborn baby, to my pony baby. And it was the most adorable thing. I don't know how the world didn't explode (laughs) from the adorableness. I assume you took Um, 55,000 pictures. I took a lot of pictures Um, and my child, bless her heart, is absolutely fearless. And of course, I've been indoctrinating her with stuffed ponies and model horses because she's not met a horse up to this point. No, she hasn't met one up until now. You're a delinquent mom. (laughs) Well, we live in the suburbs and I haven't gotten to take her home Uh, because it's a it's a bit of a road trip to go meet my horse at my parents. Um, So I've I've obviously gone and seen my horse multiple times, but I haven't gotten to take the child. Um, So, yes, I am a delinquent mother, (laughs) but I did make up for it. Um, It was freezing cold. It was way too cold. So she's out there in her fuzzy little onesie. um, And she, of course, Loved the horse, loved Ginger. Um, yes, I have a chestnut mare named Ginger. Ginger it's a course. long story. <laughs> it's I didn't name her. Okay, um, isn't every oh, chestnut pony named Ginger? I mean, I well, I've had two red. other chestnut horses, and I didn't name them Ginger. I, it's we'll have to tell that story another time. Okay. Um, so yes, I have a chestnut mare named Ginger, but, um, she has not been ridden in years. She is retired. She has laminitis issues, whatever. Uh, she's very old, but my sweet little child, I just couldn't resist putting her on my mare's back. Um, and of course I put her up on Ginger's back and she starts bouncing up and down like she's been doing on her stuffed horses at home. And my heart broke with the adorableness. And then I walked them around the yard. And of course, Ginger was a total saint worth her weight in gold. But that's your hallmark moment for the day, everybody. Uh, that's so cute. Um, <laughs> making another horse girl. So you what, know, what's your daughter's name? Her name is Naomi. Naomi and Ginger. Yes. <laughs> that's perfect. It, well, and I'll, I can send you a picture if you want to share it. Oh, yeah, we can put it in the show notes. Definitely okay. do that. <laughs> so that's my, my cute tidbit. That's my Hallmark moment. And, um, yeah, I have finally rectified. You know, by next year, she's going to want a, her pony of her own, right? So you're, you're, you're now – you're totally screwed now. <laughs> so. I know. I was kind of like, why am I doing this to my wallet? Like, <laughs> yeah, what is exactly. – this is, this is satanic. What am I doing? But I had to. I'm, I'm a horse girl. I work in a horse job. I, oh, I still own a horse. I still feel fortunate enough to have a, and I mean, she's got to be, she's a grade mare, but she's getting up there. She's got to be close to 30, if not over 30. It's, you know, honestly, I, I had my, I was holding my breath, hoping that my last horse would make it to meet my daughter. So oh, I'm so happened. happy that happened for you. That's Thank cool. you. So yeah, happy, happy moment for everybody. <laughs> my Facebook friends, I think their listeners actually got their children both girls got their children ponies for Christmas. Aww. So every girl's dream, right? A pony for Christmas? Yes. Well, they, I, I know two that did that this year. Oh, that's adorable. I know. And you're going to be Wonderful. doing that next year. So there I you go. know. <laughs> I well, know. you know what? We're going to have a way for you to buy one, actually. We're going to talk about that later in the show. Yes, this is true. So tell us who's coming up today. 
Oh, boy. So we have a pretty great show. Uh, We're going to have Jessica Anderson, who's one of my wonderful co-workers who works at Equine Affair with me. She's going to come on and talk about how you can participate in the Breed Pavilion and the Horse and Farm exhibits. That's going to be cool. Uh, We're also going to hear from Jason Irwin, who I understand was on the show last year. Jason is a horse trainer. He'll be one of our headlining clinicians at our 23 Ohio event, which is coming up in April. So Jason's going to come on and talk about horses and getting youth to train horses. And then we're going to hear from Mary Martin. She is the president and founder of the New England Equine Rescue North. I had the pleasure of interviewing her at our 22 Massachusetts event, all about her rescue. So you'll get some insight into how Near North is helping horses in New England. Very good. And I have heard from a couple of our listeners. We are, Jennifer and I are going to be there uh, in Ohio, so at Equine Yay. Affair, and we'll we'll probably be there most of the time, actually, because we're just gonna we're gonna camp there. So uh, and we will be doing meetups. I'll, we'll have more announcements about that. We might even we're going to talk to Allison after the show today, and we're going to work out. We might even be doing a show live from there, or you know something like that that you guys can attend. So we're going to work out all the details, and we'll let you know all the details. Uh, but we'll have more on that in next month's show. Yeah, you can get Glenn's autograph, you know? Right. <laughs> like anybody wants that. <laughs> well, maybe you could bring some of Scooter's horseshoes or... Yeah, we need to bring his, Scooter autographs. You could bring Scooter autographs. You could, you know, there are some famous racehorses where, like, their manure has been sold. So, you know, that's a way to... <laughs> that's what I should do. We usually do handouts of something, you know, that has HR and logos. I need to get Scooter's pictures like the celebrities do and have him do, do the ink hoof prints on them. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. You should or, or whisker prints if he's really whiskery. Could he like? Oh, he do loves a little... lipping things. So yeah. we could just put paint on his lips, like uh, edible paint. Yeah, exactly. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or I not. Think it doesn't perfect. matter with Scooter. He eats anything. So <laughs> that's a good idea. I have to try to think about that. They'll be the only ones in the world to have Scooter autographs. I love it. You should do that. I should do that, actually. You're right. All right. uh, Coming up first on today's show, we do have Jason Irwin. And uh, tell us a little bit about Jason. Yeah. So Jason is a lifelong equestrian. He's a horse trainer from Ontario, Canada. So represent Canada. He and his wife, Bronwyn, operate Jason and Bronwyn Irwin Horsemanship. They teach horse training clinics, they put on training demonstrations, and they present at horse events throughout North America, like Equine Affair. Jason began his training career focusing on colt starting and fixing problem horses, and he also uh, has done advanced training and liberty work. And he works with both Western and English writers, so there will be something for everybody in his presentations at Equine Affair in Ohio. And today we're going to talk to him a little bit about how to help kids or children or teenagers work with help them train horses Mm -hmm. so a little bit different focus today with jason hi jason welcome to the show oh thanks so much for having me how's the weather up there in canada right now cold (laughs) it's uh (laughs) it's pretty raw oh man is there there's snow on the ground and everything uh, it's been kind of strange here. We had a really, really bad storm. We had fences where the snow was higher than the fences. That's the six foot mark and stuff like that. Ugh. Uh, but then we got a little melt and it went away. So we don't have a whole lot of snow on the ground, but, uh, you wouldn't want to go out wearing your swimming suit. No, <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to go out wearing my swimsuit anytime in Canada, to be honest. So <laughs> But then I'm from Florida, so <laughs> right. Glenn's See, probably that's a myth. recording we have it. <laughs> Oh, go ahead. I was going to say that that's a myth to say it's cold up here. We have at least two nice weeks every year. <laughs> that's right. Oh. <laughs> and and the mosquitoes are out those two weeks. So yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. So never a swimsuit week, not with the mosquitoes. Yeah. So. <laughs> So, Jason, we're uh, we're happy to have you back on the show. You were on Horses in the Morning last year, and then you've been on the Equine Affair podcast before during our very first season when I was very green and very awkward, I'm sure. So hopefully I'm less green and awkward now. Um, but let's let's kind of catch up a little bit. So 
remind our audience, what do you and your lovely wife do? Uh, what's your focus with horses? What's your philosophy on training? Sure. Uh, well, my wife, Brown and I have an outfit that's basically called Jason and Brown Irwin Horsemanship. And the main focus of what we do is teaching clinics. And we do cover quite a quite a range of topics. However, if you really want to condense it down, I would say a lot of it is how to put a really good foundation on a horse and basically mm-hmm. get them where they're pretty suitable to most events. Now, having said that, we do Liberty clinics, cult starting clinics. Um, we present at horse expos, uh, different events and all those types of things. So it's a real cross section, but I would say it kind of at the core of it, it's sort of the fundamentals and helping a lot of people get along better with their horses. Yeah, and you do both Western and English, right? So it's kind of cross-disciplinary there. Uh, we definitely do. I look a little funny in an English saddle, I'm not going to lie. So, uh, <laughs> How do you look uh, in riding breeches there, Jason? Um, I, I, I think it's best that the world never knows. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my wife there, she actually came from an English background and then switched to Western, although she definitely still does ride English. And then I've always been a little bit more in the Western end of it. However, Mm -hmm. a lot of the training that we do is maybe slightly more familiar in the Western world than the English. So a lot of times we kind of take what's in our part of the industry and take it to the English side of it. And uh, we also train horses too. And we start a lot of horses that are going out to be dressage horses and jumpers and all those types of things. So when it kind of comes right down to it, the foundation, the fundamentals are the same, no matter what type of saddle you ride in. Yeah, absolutely. And and Glenn's listeners know that. And they're probably all nodding their heads uh, as vigorously as I am right now. So that's really cool. So mm-hmm. we're going to have both of you. We get the pleasure of having both you and Bronwyn at Equine Affair in Ohio in April, uh, just a few short months away. And um, I was hoping we could talk a little bit about one of the topics you're going to present on, which is teaching youth to train horses. So um, I wanted to ask in particular What do you look for when you're buying a horse or selecting a horse for a youth to train as opposed to an adult? Do you approach that differently? Do you look for different things? Well, I would say there that, uh, trying to think of the best way to put this, I think when someone's looking for a youth horse, I think one thing they maybe have to keep in mind is that's quite likely not going to be the kid's forever horse. Because mm-hmm. a lot of times the youth will sort of outgrow their horses. So one mistake sometimes I see people make is, I'll just use jumping for an example. It could be anything. But if somebody has a, a child and they're getting into riding and they're in the jumping end of things, if they go out and get them a horse that's the caliber that could go to the Olympics, they're going to get into a lot of trouble along the way. And they're never really going to get the benefit of the horse. And quite likely the kid is going to get into trouble. So a lot Mm -hmm. of times I think sometimes it's a mistake to think what's the best horse for the job. It should be more what's the best horse uh, for the youth at this stage. Also on that note though, too, the kids usually improve so fast that a lot of times if you buy them a horse for where they are today, it seems like within no time at all they have grown it. So I think you sort of want to buy one that it's what they can handle today, but where there is some ability there to improve and uh, have some future success as well. Now, having said all that stuff, actually, when we do the clinics, we really try to meet people where they're at. So whether no matter what age the participant is, we're really there to say, okay, what's your, where are you at? Where's your horse at? How can we help you get along the best? We're not really going to go in and say, hey, you really should sell this horse and get another one. Like, I guess if there was an extreme case of it, maybe we would make, make a little bit of an exception and drop a few hints. But having said that, though, we just try to meet folks where they're at and kind of uh, help them fill in the spaces that maybe aren't working so great. Yeah, I mean, that makes total sense to me. You want a horse that you can handle today, but also grow with and ride tomorrow and next year and that sort of thing. And, you know, some youths and some adults, we get super attached to our horses and we don't want to admit when we've outgrown them. Do you do you run into that a lot or are people usually able to listen when you say, hey, maybe you maybe it's time to move on? Well, with that one there, being honest. Uh, we don't 
we're usually not the ones telling somebody to, to move yeah. on. Um, yeah. Actually, I notice though, when you see kids and parents, a lot of times it's actually the parent that doesn't want to part with it more than the kid. And uh-huh. that because if you have a, a youth, if they got a horse when they were 12 years old, by the time they're 16 and have the same horse, a lot of times they are getting a little bit bored. Like they've moved up the ladder quite a bit. Uh-huh. And uh, a lot of times I'll notice the youth is quite happy to, to get another one. Now notice I said another one. Sometimes they don't really want to part with the first one. They just want to add uh-huh. another one. Right. And uh, so that's, that's how you end up with a field full of them. But uh, <laughs> I I think it's, again, I'm not definitely not telling people go out and get rid of your, your horse, sure. but I just think that sometimes like, it's like anything else. Uh, people advance so much in those early years that what's good today might not be real suitable five years from now. Yeah. Well, and that happened to me and my family. I got my first horse and then we added my second horse and then uh, the third one got given to us. And then the fourth one, my father went out and rescued. So I, it's not entirely my fault that we ended up with a field of horses, but uh, we definitely <laughs> we we committed and we kept them. <laughs> you're, you're saying you did you did play a part. You weren't the problem, but you were involved. Right. I was involved. Uh <laughs> So, so how about, um, what do you try to teach youth about handling their emotions with training horses? Do you run into that where they get, maybe it's super easy to get really frustrated when you're younger and your horse isn't, you know, responding the way that you want. Do you run into dealing with emotion or is that really not an issue? No, actually, I'd say you hit the nail on the head with that one. Uh, one of the two things I would say pop up with the youth the most is the emotion uh, part of it, and it is usually frustration. It's just mm-hmm. that they feel like they're asking the way that they should, and the horse isn't doing it. They start to get a little bit upset, and then a lot of times that vibe kind of goes through the horse. So basically, you take a situation that wasn't great, but they kind of make it a little bit worse without meaning to, and that so uh, that one definitely comes up for sure. Really, the way around that one I've always found, though, is the more that you can teach somebody, no matter what age they are, that here's why the horse is doing this, here's how to take a different approach. Once somebody knows more, the frustration level really goes down because when they run into a little problem, they just they kind of automatically know what to do to fix it. So instead of saying the horse is acting up and just as a, a vague term, instead it's more like, oh, the horse is doing this, therefore I need to do that. Uh, to fix it. Yeah, so it it kind of teaches problem solving as well as how to master your emotions. For sure. I think the better somebody gets at the problem solving end of it, and I'm not talking severe problems, it's not all the running and bucking and all the, sure. all the really wild <laughs> stuff, but just the little things day to day when there's a little issue, if they know how to fix that issue, they really there's no need, I guess you could say, really to get very worked up about it because it just becomes automatic. And uh, a lot of the the youth training, now one thing is with the youth, they're sometimes actually a heck of a lot easier to teach than the adults because you're not really trying to break very many habits. Sometimes with an adult, you'll say, here, I'd like you to do stuff and such in this way. And then they maybe tell you how so-and-so told them something different and that they saw something on YouTube and they read something from somebody else. And that where when you ask one of the youth to do something, they're like, yep, sure. And they go ahead and do it. So sometimes they're (laughs) actually a little bit easier to advance. That makes it your job a little bit easier too, I bet. (laughs) Oh, yeah. And really, most horse kids are a little bit gung-ho. So they're, they're the ones like they're there. They want to be there. They want to be involved. They're really interested in learning. So uh, it, it's a pretty good crowd to work with. Yeah. And I bet it's fun. Cause I mean, with adults, I, I know myself, I tend to bring all my troubles with me when I go ride and it takes me a little while to let go of it and just be in the moment. Whereas I remember being a kid, I would just be, Hey, I'm happy to be at the barn. We'll forget about homework and math and, you know, whatever, like, let's just ride. And, and I, I bet that I can't be the only adult who carries everything with me and has a hard time letting go of it, even when I'm having fun. No, I'd say you're absolutely right on that one. A lot of times the youth, I say they are just really gung ho. And I think really when folks are young, they live in the moment more. So as Mm -hmm. long as they're on their horse, as long as they're having a good time, they're happy campers. 
Awesome. Well, uh, I wanted to ask, what are you looking forward to the most about coming down and being with us in Ohio in April? What are you excited about? Uh, I think the main thing really is just coming back because obviously there was those couple of years where it didn't run, uh, mm-hmm. same as everything else in the world. And we were down there in t- maybe, I think, 2019. And uh, we were at the Equine Affair in Ohio and the Massachusetts event. And honestly, we just had so much fun there. Um, it's hard for me to actually say which part was the best just because we enjoyed so much of it. We met a ton of folks there, other trainers, the staff and all the folks that run Equine Affair, like they're just the best group ever. Everybody treats you like family. And uh, it was just a great experience from the time we walked in the door to the time we went home. So again, I may be jumping around on your question a little bit, but I just looking forward to, to being there again. Yeah, well, we're we're going to be we're really excited to have you back, and I'm so glad your wife's coming too, and you guys get to have some fun. Um, are you bringing horses with you? We were kind of hemming and hawing on that, but I think we've decided not to do it. One thing is a lot of the clinics that, uh, well, both of us actually are doing, they're ones that do involve quite a bit of uh, uh, coaching, like directly back and forth with somebody else that's on a horse. So very often I will ask to hop on their horse for just a minute if they're having a little bit of trouble. So I I used to always bring a horse with me to different events, but then I found half the time my problem was getting rid of my horse so that I could get on the next horse. And it just kind of turned into a little bit of a jumble. Having said that, oh, sometimes it is really nice to have a well-trained horse there because it makes it easier to say, here, this is what I'm after, and then demonstrate it so that everybody can see. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of trade-offs both ways. Yeah. Well, it's easier traveling without, I'm sure. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) Plus, we have to cross the border, too. So every time you bring stock over, there's always that moment at the border where you hold your breath and pray the paperwork is right. Yes. (laughs) Well, we will we will wave that thought away. Everything will go super smoothly. Um, (laughs) I know you're not bringing stock this time, but but there's always that. So, well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It was great to hear from you again. And we just really appreciate it. Oh, thank, again, thanks so much for having me. And uh, I guess we're going to see you guys before too long, and we're sure looking forward to it. Absolutely. Us too. Is your horse fearless when it comes to obstacles? Have you tried every discipline under the sun and you're still looking for a challenge? Then we're looking for you. Apply today to compete in the 2023 Ohio Versatile Horse and Rider Competition. With $5,500 in cash and other prizes at stake, what are you waiting for? The event will take place on Friday, April 14th at the Ohio Expo Center in Columbus during Equine Affair. Find out everything you need to know, and you can apply at equineaffair.com. Where our next guest is Jessica. She's Breed's Exhibits Manager for Equine Affair, and we're going to talk about one of the one of my favorite things is when I go to Equine Affair, and that's checking out all the different breeds. Hi, Jessica. Hi there. How are you? Good. So let's talk about the Breeds Exhibits at Ohio. As I understand it, people, if they have a breed that they want to exhibit and they want to bring their horses there, they still have time to sign up. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, We are still accepting applications for our 23 Ohio events as well as our um, Massachusetts event, but primarily we are working, obviously, on our Ohio event, which is coming up here shortly. Um, Yeah, and our goal is to have a diverse um, selection of horses on the breed pavilion floor um, as far as your, like from your minis up to your giraffes um, and everything in between. Um, so if you have any of those, if you have a breeding program, um, certainly check us out on the website. Um, you can find the application there along with my email um as far as any questions you can send me any questions that you may have um as far as exhibiting how do we know what breeds you're looking for or you already have um there is a current list on our website which i will be updating um as the time goes by like closer to the event but as of now what is listed on our um 
website is our current list that we, what we have on the floor currently. And so if I want to bring a couple of horses from my breed and, you know, let's say hackney ponies, cause I have hackney pony um, and, and they're cute as heck. So all they have <laughs> to do is stand there and do nothing and it's good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but do, what do I have to do if I'm an exhibitor? Do I have to show, show them in the ring or, you know, what, what do they do? So we do offer um, different sizes of exhibit spaces um, that do include a, a stall along with that exhibit space. Now you don't necessarily have to have that stall, although that is a um, very high attraction for our attendees to come and meet and greet those horses on the breed pavilion floor. Um, and as far as presentation wise with the breed exhibit space, we do offer um, breed demonstration times, which will be held in the Coliseum, the Voinovich Arena, and the covered broad covered paddock. Um, and that is where they would put together a a script, if you will, for um, describing the breed and kind of giving a brief description of the breed's history and what their you know the attributes are, etc. Um, and that is to be pre-recorded. Um, but as far as like, there's no one singular person that necessarily needs to be standing with a microphone, you know, reading this off. So if, you know, somebody's not necessarily very uh, comfortable speaking in front of a large group, um, that never fear. <laughs> we have that covered. Um, now, do you, do they, get, do they get to ride and kind of demonstrate or, or drive and kind of demonstrate their horses in the ring? Yes. Yeah. So, and that, that is, yeah, they can be either in hand depending on, or ridden or driven depending on their training level. Um, so, and, you know, if there is a specific breed that has a diverse discipline, that they're they are capable of, then we certainly welcome you know all of the above to um, to be presented. Um, we do, however, limit our the number of horses that are in the arena at the same time, just for safety reasons. Um, that limit would be ten horses for our breed demonstrations. Okay, sounds good. Uh, so I know that you also you try and highlight uh, endangered breeds, right? Right. And, uh, but, you know, they don't have to be, but uh, I know you do make an effort to do that. It's kind of it, the, the, talking about preservation of endangered breeds and that kind right. of thing. Right. Yeah. So as far as having the, the booth space, um, if it is a endangered horse breed, um, you know, we do like to highlight that. That way they can get extra, not necessarily extra traction, but just, you know, the traction to be viewed by the attendees and, you know, maybe, you know, not everybody obviously knows that they are, they are endangered or that they're even out there um, to help kind of bring awareness to those, those organizations. And hopefully from there they can, you know, gain, gain um, funding and whatnot um, from just those, again, those attendees that aren't necessarily aware that they were there. Well, and something kind of fun just happened related to that subject. Um, I had posted on our social media recently about the Dales Pony because we had the Dales Pony They're in our so breed darn pavilion. Cute. I want a Dales they... Pony. <laughs> <laughs> See, and um, they had Ponies presented with us in Massachusetts, and then someone commented on the post and said, "Yes, two years ago I saw a Dales Pony for the first time at Equine Affair, and now I own one." So oh, that awesome. is a yeah. real tangible story of how somebody encounters right. a breed that's going, you know, because the Dales Pony is pretty rare. Um, yeah, I keep were trying to find one for five hundred dollars, and I'm not having any luck. So <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, so that's a real tangible story of like, hey, I found out about this breed, and now I own one, and they're helping to preserve it. So that's kind of a right. just a neat way the breed pavilion is in action, and so that's. I just love that. I thought that was so cool when I saw that pop up on Facebook. So yeah. continue. Well, on the, but, yeah. Essentially on the same level as that, like as far as just maybe not your super rare or more rare breeds, like, you know, you may find that, you know, such and such horse is capable of doing this where you thought that, you know, they, in your mind, they were only good for, you know, Western and you primarily do English or, you know, what have you like that sort of thing. They can, 
you know, a lot of the horses are much more diverse than what, you know, necessarily the general public may may be aware. Well, that's very cool. Well, I wanted to also ask you about the horse and farm. You're in charge of the horse and farm exhibits. What's it, what exactly does that entail? So that is where um, the exhibit space is essentially horse stalls. Um, it's the best way I can necessarily describe it. If you've ever been like to a horse show, so to speak, like you can put up banners um, and kind of exhibit your your farm or your breeding program or training program um, and put out like flyers. If you have say horses for sale or anything like that, we also have a spot. Um, you can indicate that and, you know, we can have that horse listed on our website in addition to a placard that can be put on your, that horse's stall for when the general public is walking through the, the horse of farm exhibits and, you know, they may be able to, didn't know that they were looking for something and come across something and that catches their eye. Or if they're specifically looking for something, that could be a good place um, to find. But the, again, the exhibit space comes with um, their stalls and depending on how many they need um, and a listing in our program. Um, that way, if somebody comes across you or them in the in the in the barn and they forget, you know, hey, so and so was there, I can kind of look back and see, get that contact information from our website. Okay, so Jessica, something I was hoping we could talk about today is the Sail Horse Showcase because we did that in Massachusetts last fall, but this will be our very first time bringing it to Ohio. So let's talk about that. What's that about? So that is where um, each individual who has a horse for sale or for adoption in the horse and farm exhibits is um, able to sign up for um, to exhibit the horses within that showcase. And that will be, we'll have that on Thursday and Saturday in the Coliseum. Um, we are capping our numbers at 20 horses. So the first 20 horses to sign up um, will be exhibited within that showcase. Okay. And so really that's a chance for anyone who wants to sell their horse and bring their horse to Equine Affair. Not only do they get the benefit of the stall, the sale horse stall or the adoption affair, but they also get to put their horse in the Coliseum at a given time and exhibit them and show them off to a whole crowd at once, right? Correct. So we will, um, direct the horses in we'll have them kind of all staged behind the scenes and we'll do like we'll lead lead one in or send one in at, at a time and while they're mm -hmm. in there um we'll have their brief description and their stall number etc um read aloud over um the loudspeaker um and it's we're kind of setting it up more like an auction type setting that way we can get as many horses in there as we can Right. Um, so, no, it, it was very well perceived at the Ohio or Massachusetts events. Um, so we're hoping that we have the same same success in Ohio. Yeah. So there you have it. So if you have a horse or a horse related business or a horse for sale, or if you're a rescue and you have horses for adoption, uh, please contact Jessica. Go to our website at equineaffair.com and find out more about applying to exhibit in the Breed Pavilion and the Horse and Farm exhibits in Ohio or Massachusetts. We are looking for you. Um, we want you to put your horses and your businesses in the spotlight and help make our show bigger and better than ever. So next up, we have Mary Martin, who is the president and founder of New England Equine Rescue North or Near North. She has been involved with horses for over 40 years. She started her own rescue in 2008, and she is a licensed riding instructor and a member of multiple horse-related organizations. Mary works with other equine rescues locally and nationally to advocate for equine welfare and to raise public awareness of and support for rescue activities. So let's start out. Tell us who you are, who you're with, and what your passion is. My name is Mary Martin and I'm with New England Equine Rescue. We're also known as Near North. I'm the president and founder. And we started in 2008, got our 501c3 in 2011, 
and we rescue horses, donkeys, and mules from a variety of situations, crisis situations. And what do you think is important for people to know about your rescue? What makes it unique or particularly helpful for others? I think it's important for people to know about our rescue, that we're more than just helping horses, donkeys, and mules in crisis. We also try to help keep horses in their home to avoid the trauma of moving around. Um, we will help people short term if they're struggling. We will reach out to other rescues if we're full and try to see if they could help or vice versa. They will reach out to us as well. And we pride ourselves in a great network. It's not just about getting the horses in. We also go above and beyond vetting and getting the horse to a good place to avoid it coming back to us. Although if it does, we will definitely take it back. But we pride ourselves on really good matches. The match is more important than anything else. What's the process like when you get that first call all the way to trying to place the horse for adoption? Kind of walk us through the steps that each horse takes at your rescue. The process, if we get a call for a horse in need, we reach out to the person, see if it's financial, if it's um, a health issue or whatever the crisis situation may be. And then we do our best to get them calm and know that we're here to help. We then try to make room. If we don't make room, we'll help them network, as I said. Um, but if we do have room, we will arrange transport to get the horse in. We give them about a week to settle so they're not stressed just from the move. Sometimes the horses have been in the same home for a long time. And then we start with the poking and prodding with the veterinarian and the farrier and we make see what they need, give them whatever they need. And if it's a rehabilitation process, we start that um, and work with our trainer. The trainer gets to the point where the horse is adoptable and we have applicants and we see if we think up front that it's a match. We talk to them before we have them in so we don't waste time. And then they come in, they see the horse, they try the horse. We discuss it again with the trainer. And if we think it's a match, we'll send it out. If we're not 100% sure it's a match, but we're pretty sure, we may offer a trial period with the trainer following up. Our goal is the horse doesn't come back and has a forever home. But as you know, life happens. So. Forever Home is kind of a big ask, but we have a really good track record because we're honest about what the horse's uh, negative issues are, and we highlight the positive as well. But you know what you're getting when you adopt from near, so there are no surprises. Yeah, I love that. And then tell us about what you guys are doing here at Equine and Fair. Did you bring horses with you? What's your purpose of, of being here and presenting? So we love being at Equine Affair. Um, we brought horses and we also have a booth. We spread the word, we let people know we're here. Again, we're trying to network. We usually get some good volunteers out of it. Um, my event quarter coordinator is a perfect example. She's been wonderful and she met us here at Equine Affair. She's been with us three years now, I believe. And um, it's just reaching out, letting people know we cover all of New England. We're not just state-based, but we try to stay local. Um, charity starts at home, in our opinion. There's a lot of need in the area. I believe we had 120 horse requests, surrender requests, since the first of the year. And um, I think it was 40 on the books right now for the last month and a half. So there's a huge need in New England. No need to go out of state. Lots of people need help right here at home. Yeah. And so the horses you brought with you, were they part of the adoption affair? Yes, so we brought horses for the adoption affair, and we brought a portly miniature and we, who has tons of applications in. We brought Sammy, who's three and a half years old. He's very green, but he's an old soul. And both of our animals have tons of applications in. We don't just push them out the door. We're going to go home from here, sort through, pick what we feel is the best match, bring them in, have them assessed, and um, we'll get them the best home possible. What do you look for in a potential adopter's home? Like, what's the most important part to you when you're trying to place a horse with an adopter? So when we're looking at an adoptive home, mm -hmm. um, we do reference checks, vet, farrier, um, other horse people, and the property, we don't expect you to have a mansion. It doesn't have to be immaculate. But we do look for safety. We don't want 
a ton of mud, which springtime there's a ton of mud. But um, we do look for that. We don't want them in mud year round. Um, we do not allow barbed wire. We need safe fencing. So we do look at the property to make sure it's safe. So safety and um, your passion and how you care about the animals is the most important thing to us. So. Yeah. And what do you feel personally, what drives you to get up every day and deal with such a, because it's a challenging emotional job, right? Yes. <laughs> what drives you personally about doing what you do? What drives me about getting up every morning and going out there is to know that we're making a difference be it the horses that I'm looking at, the rehab that we're doing, just the phone calls, or even here at Equine Affair, people are going out of the way to come up and say, hey, I adopted from you five years ago. We're doing great, although we do follow up anyway. But it's nice to hear that the word is getting out, and um, we have a really good reputation, and we strive to keep that. But it's just knowing that we're making a huge difference. Yeah. And then kind of a more lighthearted question is, what have you enjoyed the most about being here this year at Equine Affair personally? Like, have you gotten to go shopping? Have you gotten to have fun? What's... Well, I haven't had a lot of chance to shop. We will be trying to walk around more today the last day. Yeah. But it's just been great meeting people, talking to people, talking about our mission, um, even down at the barn, talking about the animals. I mean, everybody on our team is passionate. Every volunteer, once they've been there, I think six months, they realize it's a really special place that we have. And um, watching them spread the word is, is wonderful. And um, I saw a couple shows, the end of a couple shows as I'm running back and forth. But it's, it's really fun. It's always fun here. Good, good. What's a really meaningful story to you of a horse that you helped that everybody had given up on? We have many meaningful stories, um, but one that pops out the most is we got a frantic call from a basic beginner who had bailed a halflinger, very dangerous animal. And she tried, I have to give the woman credit, she tried her best. She went through three trainers. Each and every trainer said, put this horse in the ground, and she wouldn't give up. And she got the word that Mary Martin likes a challenge. <laughs> So we took Marvel in, and I have to tell you, in my over 50 years of doing this, um, he made my hair stand up to a point, and I was on the fence. And I actually, it was winter, to his benefit, because if I wanted to euthanize him, it was winter. So I said, well, let's let him sit through winter, and we'll make a decision in spring. And he was still difficult. He was dangerous. We had to protect our volunteers. But he just slowly started to come around. We had a novice volunteer who he, for some reason, um, took a liking to, and she was able to actually go in cautiously. We were very cautious about everything. Um, and we did make progress. It took four years, which is a point I'd like to make that we don't euthanize for space. We don't euthanize for anything. Danger is an issue, but we'll give every chance, as with Marvel, and um, quality of life. But he was 12 years old. He was young. He was healthy. He just would try to kill you if you went near his hind end. So um, actually, after four years, a lot of work, a lot of training, a lot of caution tape, <laughs> um, Marvel is now a therapy pony for Aww. kids. And that's one of my happier stories, that we, we don't give up until we have to give up. So That's amazing. I love that. Yeah. What we a, have more. We have more like that. <laughs> yeah, but what a crazy success to go from dangerous to, to kids yeah. safe. He has his own Facebook page, Marvelous oh. Marvel. If people would like to help us at Near North, you can go on our website at www.nearnorth.org. There's a help section. There are many ways to help. You can help from home. You can help in the office. You can help around the property. We have lots of maintenance issues. Um, you can help feed. You can help... Um, there's lots of mucking to do. Yes. You can sign up for events. You can choose one event a year or as many as you'd like. There's a whole events team. We're desperate need for grant people. We'd like people on our grants team. We do not receive any state funding at all. We are all mostly volunteer and um, we rely on public support, fundraising, events, and donations. So lots of ways to help. You can also find us on Facebook at Near North Place. 
Are you interested in exhibiting your horses or your horse-related business in the Breed Pavilion or the Horse and Farm Exhibits at Equine Affair in Ohio? Help us make this year's event bigger and better than ever and put your horses in the spotlight at North America's premier equine expo happening this spring at the Ohio Expo Center, April 13th through the 16th, 2023. Email us at info at equineaffair.com or visit our website to learn more about how you can exhibit your horses at Equine Affair. So before we wrap up the show today, are tickets available for Equine Affair and what's available now? What what can they buy now? They can buy everything now. Okay. Uh, they, they can buy general admission tickets. You can buy your four-day passes. Uh, so that means you get a deal on tickets and you can get in and out uh, all day, every day for four whole days. Uh, you can also buy your tickets for Fantasia, which is our wonderful nighttime show. We haven't talked about that in this episode, but if you ha- are an avid listener, you've heard us talk about Fantasia. And you probably remember from last month, I told you to buy your tickets early um, and to make sure that you get the seats that you want. Uh, The seats, the really good seats go fast and they go early. So make sure you buy those and you can buy all those tickets, everything I just mentioned at equineaffair.com. Can I ask you a little bit about, I saw some of the auditors posting about where to stay and and Columbus has gotten a reputation, whether it's accurate or not about you know being dangerous in spots and all of that i didn't find that around the expo center no i i've stayed i want to say two or three times now and i haven't really encountered that either um we do if you're worried about it because i've I've heard that concern as well uh from people um if you're worried about it we do have a list of host hotels that we work with um, on our website. So if you go to equineaffair.com and you click Ohio and then you click host hotels, um, you can see the ones we work with. They're listed by distance from the venue. And those are all good hotels. We wouldn't point you to one that wasn't. Um, and they also have, usually they'll have room blocks and maybe discounts. So make sure you mention that when you're booking that it's for equine affair. And you can usually get a pretty good deal there. Um, so, yeah, that's where I would recommend starting. Um, but, I, yeah, personally, I haven't run into any problems going either. Okay, very good. So it's equineaffair.com for all the information that you need on Ohio. And, of course, if you want to listen to any of the past episodes that we've done here, you can go to horsesinthemorning.com, scroll down to the middle of the page, and you're going to see an Equine Affair banner. Just click on that, and it brings you to all of the past episodes and all the guests that we've had on. So once again, thank you so much for joining me today, and we're going to look forward to chatting with you about uh, what we're going to be doing when we come out to Equine Affair. We're getting so excited about it because uh a couple of weeks after that i get to go on a cruise in norway so uh, i i i get to do the fun things at equine affair fun things at uh land rover and then go on a cruise so it's all happy time yeah <laughs> so, everybody wants to be glenn in that's, that's april right. in april and may you want to be glenn. april and may you want to be <laughs> it's glenn. not the only time you want to be glenn but that, 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 <laughs> that's that, not true <laughs> So thank you, Allison. Appreciate it. We'll see everybody. And tomorrow we will be doing some really bad ads. So get your ads into Jennifer at horseradionetwork.com. And it's so funny. Before we go, you got to hear really bad ads for the first time, right? And I loved it. Yes, it was. It was amazing. There's a reason Fridays are always our most popular day. (laughs) (laughs) All right. We'll see you all tomorrow.